All right, well, thank you, everybody. We're uh, to our last panel of the, of the conference. Uh, so what we'll do is, is take up this panel, and then we'll have a few minutes for uh, closing comments, and also some questions at the end of this panel. But what I'd like to do first is just introduce um, this panel. We call this planning and siting for wind energy in Wyoming, but really we thought as a closing panel we could get some perspectives uh, from stakeholders again, kind of coming back in part to where we started. Um, and in order to facilitate this panel, we have uh, asked our, our Spicer chair at the Hop School to uh, take a stab at, at this at moderating a group of, of people and, and waiting to hear what their perspectives might be. Um, Steve has been here for, how long has it been now? <laughs> 10 years? No, seven. seven? Feels like 10. ten it's <laughs> no, Steve uh, has, has been with the Hop School. He's also a member of the uh, Ag and Applied Economics Department. Uh, he uh, works on collaborative decision making and processes and, and works particularly in how to solve uh, problems collaboratively in a way that uh, can balance mutual interests, which is something that we have been working on really through this entire conversation over the last two days. And so that was why we asked Steve to be here. And so with that, I'll just turn it over to him and we'll look forward to the last panel, so thank you. Okay, thanks, Ron. So today's panel, I mean, the last panel of the day, is sort of a catch-all, maybe. Uh, so if you look at the, at, at the um, agenda uh, in the program, uh, it, it, the program states, you know, what's needed to craft proactive county-level and coherent statewide approach to wind energy development? I, you know, that's a pretty good question. I know that there have been a few people have asked questions about, well, you know, um, <coughs> You know, so do we need planning? So for example, I think Steve Williams yesterday stood up near the end of, I think it was the, uh, the values panel, and he said, we need a comprehensive statewide wind plan. So I thought, well, that, that will kick that around. I don't know if we do. So we have a group of panelists here uh, who we've asked to address a, a, a wide ranging set of questions around this idea of of, um, you know, do we need to craft some sort of proactive approach to wind siting, wind development siting, uh, and planning. Uh, and another corollary question that we're sort of going to be looking at is, how can we best manage our opportunities to maximize benefits and, and minimize costs for the new wind? And then thirdly, what are the next steps for Wyoming? What should we be doing? What should we, where should we be taking this? Um, so with that, um, I want to introduce the panel very briefly, and then uh, they will tell you more about who they are. It would be presumptuous of me to read their bios and convince you that I know them. I know a couple of them. Uh, uh, and, um, and then one after they've introduced themselves, maybe you can say a, a, a few remarks about your thinking on this topic. Uh, I have about, about eight questions that we might uh, sort of have a conversation down the line here um, about this, these concepts that we've sort of bandied around here and there during this conference. And in fact, I think I was going to stand up and ask Larry to stop because he was, he was pulling out a question that I had here that I really wanted to lead off with. And we're still going to do that, sort of this combination between, sort of this juxtaposition between regulation and planning and how we think about that. So, on our panel, uh, going uh, down the line, we have uh, Mark Milburn from LS Power, uh, Juan Carlos Carvio Delfino from uh, Veritas Aeolia, who you've heard from before, so he was on another panel yesterday, Ryan Lance, uh, who I, would I will introduce as uh, Sweetwater River Conservancy, but many of you know Ryan from many different hats. Uh, and he can tell you about those hats. In fact, we'll probably rely on Ryan's previous hats for some of these questions that we'll address. Uh, Senator Greg Brophy, Brophy from, from Colorado. So um, we had originally uh, thought about in this, in planning this conference as sort of having an other state perspective. Uh, just didn't work out, but we thought, all right, we still want to hang on to Greg here and get that other state perspective. Um, 
And then um, John Espy, County Commissioner from Carbon County, who's been involved now <laughs> in energy decision making and um, uh, sage grouse stuff for a long time. So I'm going to start off just by, if you guys can introduce yourselves to on down the line and sort of talk about what it is that you do and your perspective around this particular topic. Thanks. Thanks for the opportunity to uh, join you today. Uh, my, I'm Mark Milburn with LS Power. LS Power is a independent power generation and transmission development company. We've got uh, assets that we've developed uh, around the country uh, yet to develop a project in Wyoming. We've been looking at opportunities in Wyoming for a number of years in both the wind space and transmission and uh, for various reasons that I'm sure you've heard of for, for many developers. We, we've not been able to get to the finish line yet, so but we're determined and we're here. And uh, So I'm here today to give you a a uh, perspective on some of these questions from a, uh, a developer who's uh, trying to uh, put investment into the state. Um, uh, my name is Juan Carpio. As uh, Doctor said, I, I was here yesterday. Um, I'm the CEO of Marina Seoga. We are uh, developing a project at Cherry Basin. It's a, a large uh, endeavor. Uh, we've been on the permitting side and uh, trying to uh, raise awareness of, of what we, uh, what are our main concerns on, on the policy level for developing these type of projects in Wyoming. Uh, we went to Revenue Commission uh, twice this past year and uh, twice this year. And uh, we have various thoughts on how we can contribute to uh, give a vision on what we see uh, going forward for doing a solid uh, development process for, as Mark was saying, having projects in where we materialize. I mean, we have a lot of good intentions. We are all spending uh, uh, amounts of, important amounts of money in Wyoming, but we still have to make these projects happen. So in order for these projects to happen, that has to be, it's like a puzzle we have to Got many pieces together, and I believe that's kind of thing we're going to talk today. Um, I'm Brian. I'm not here in any official capacity in terms of Sweetwater, but I am here um, sort of as, as a part of the institutional memory tied to the early work in the land and renewal space in Wyoming. I was Deputy Chief of Staff to Governor Greenthal and a state planning coordinator to him at, at, at a time that we discussed earlier was pretty ripe with speculation about how there was going to be a wind turbine on everybody's front yard. Um, and um, so I hope to answer questions from that time uh, when Nicole called and said, we'd like you to sit on this panel. I thought she had really dug to the bottom of the barrel, um, that I couldn't offer much, and she related that not a lot has changed since those early days. And, in 2009 and 2010. A lot of the things that we worked to institute that Cindy and others uh, talked about on the previous panel are still operational today from generation taxes to industrial siting amendments to uh, eminent domain prohibitions on collector lines for, for wind farms. So um, happy to be here and hopefully my uh, present rec recollections are, are uh, at least somewhat akin to what actually happened. Well, I'm Greg Ruffey, and I represent the Western Way, which is a, an organization that wants to prove that conservatives do indeed care about the environment. So making it cool to be a conservative who's also an environmentalist. I'm a farmer from Northeast Colorado and a 12-year member of the Colorado legislature, nine and a half of those in the state Senate. So I was there when the state legislature in Colorado set out to purposefully make Colorado uh, a pleasant place to do business for wind energy. Of course, they were simultaneously making it harder for all the gas companies to operate, but as many of the exact same arguments that you could use up here that we did uh, down there. We, uh, we changed the law in 2006 to reduce the upfront tax burden, for instance, on wind farms. Um, it used to be like your property tax system, awfully front-loaded and declining over time. 
I ran the bill to change that to make it generate roughly the same amount of tax revenue over 20 years, but they were being taxed based on how much they generate instead of the value of the, of the investment, and it would uh, go up over time, significantly benefiting the local governments that benefit uh, that from that property tax, so that, that they would be able to plan for an increasing instead of a decreasing stream of revenue. And that's what I, that's what I like to do. I like the, the talk of politics and policy a lot more than the talk of planning and permitting. I'm John Espy. Uh, I'm in my fifth year as a commissioner of Carbon County, uh, also a fifth generation rancher. Uh, the, uh, neighbor of the Chilcherry Sahara Monterey project for full disclosure. I have about 27 miles of boundary with them as so they'll be my neighbor. Um, I just recently canceled the wind lease for full disclosure, so I've, I've been on those negotiating sides and, and seen that from, from the landowner perspective. And I believe the reason I was asked to be here is to try to give some perspective on how county planning dovetails in with state planning and the federal process as far as wind farms go. All right, thank you. Um, so I'm gonna start out with the first question, and this is sort of a bridge from the last panel. Um, so we learned from the previous panel that um, wind power in Wyoming is subject to fairly comprehensive regulations um, you know, at, at the county at the county level, state level, and, and federal levels. And, um, and, and the purpose of these regulations, ostensibly, is to you know, reduce or mitigate environmental, social, uh, or economic costs or impacts, right? So I'm wondering, you know, are our permitting processes sufficient to ensure that we're able to maximize the benefits and minimize the costs uh, to Wyoming residents and, and our environment. So, just taking a look at the from the regulatory perspective, do we need to go any farther than our regulatory uh, mechanisms to balance those costs? I'll just open it up. Anybody wants to start? Well, you have uh, this process takes about it's, it's about a three layered cake. Well, that's uh, you would have the federal regulation level, which is uh, in our case, for example, we are being the BLM land. That involves a, a whole swath of, of regulations regarding me, but regarding uh, also the uh, eagle issue. And uh, it's a thorough process where all the committees at the animal process get involved and participate in, in approving or not uh, the project going forward. So in the end, it's a holistic approach of, on the permitting side, and it's a, it's a very uh, straightforward, uh, what we call the EIS process to public uh, uh, meetings uh, at the carbon, uh, for example, our case of carbon county, at the county level, you got the lowest community level, then you have different scoping meetings uh, all over the place, and you come to a, to a good end or not so good end, and then you have some mitigation to do on that side. Then you have the middle of center of the cake, which is basically a state uh, regulations that and you go again, and some of these entities go in, work in parallel with federal entities, like uh, Wyoming Game and Fish, for example, and they overlap some of their uh, work with the federal agencies to try to streamline the process. And then you go down to the local uh, authorities, which is basically the county and the town, and you have, uh, by the county, you have construction uh, permits that you have to go through, and on the state level, we also have the trust and siding permit that to go through. So on the regulatory basis, it is, it's a very uh, clear-cut process at present, so uh, no policy, uh, additional policy involvement there at, as we speak. The external influences are coming from, from the revenue side uh, that we talked about earlier. It's been on the taxation side because of the shortfall on the state we have been hearing about on the, on the coal and mining sector. And uh, that's that's where the good news come in from our side. It's just where, where maybe we 
cause some uncertainty in Carbon County in the permitting process as our con uh, conditional use permits are good for two years and you can only renew them twice with the approval of the Board of County Commissioners. Well, uh, in six years, and I think Chuck Chair Sarah Madre has proven that it's kind of hard on, on public land to to get a, a project going. So the, those are some areas that I think we as a local agency are providing a little bit of uncertainty and we're looking at that from the county level. But as a whole, I, I think we've hit that I, sweet spot, I think, with with regulation. I don't think we can go any any deeper without being erroneous to to the proponents of these projects. Yeah, I'd just like to add a thought that uh, our company has developed projects throughout the U.S. and in all these different jurisdictions where we've successfully developed projects, we see uh, uh, a lot of different constructs in terms of regulatory uh, permitting and siting requirements. And oftentimes you have a situation in other states where uh, the county, what well, one county uh, might be competing with another county. You have situations where there's uh, uh, a state requirement and a county requirement that don't fit well together and uh, there's a conflict. You have state requirements that uh, don't uh, take into consideration county input. And so there's all kinds of potential conflicts in, in other jurisdictions. And what I found here uh, is that these, uh, the way that it's set up with the industrial siting process now and with the county processes and the way that the counties have uh, a role to play in the industrial siting process, um, and yet they still have autonomy to put on, you know, to, to go above the minimum requirements. Uh, we think it's a really robust process, and I just wanted to commend uh, what what's been done here because I think it's it's it should work really well. Right. Well, I guess just to go back, I remember the call one morning we were um, free and thought to get to the office early, and he transferred a call over to me that he had answered directly from a constituent. It was a woman in Cheyenne, and he had just been to the dedication of the new Duke facility uh, west of Cheyenne. And he said, this woman's hair is on fire about something. Um, you've been handling this wood business. Why don't you talk to her? And she got on the phone and berated me for about 15 minutes about how absolutely ridiculous it was for the governor of the state of Wyoming to be touting these new turbines outside of town because it was already windy enough in Cheyenne. How dare you put up those fans and make it more windy? And she was deadly serious. We've come a long ways, arguably, since then. Um, and and a, a lot of the issues we dealt with at the time, I remember touring the state with the governor and a band of about 400 people we had four public hearings in Kemmer and in, in Casper and Douglas, and all of the issues that have been discussed the past two days were discussed then. I remember the calls from folks that were worried about the strobe effect of, of wind turbines and the light dancing in their living room and driving them to drink and do worse things. I remember the Harry calls about, did you see this video on YouTube of this turbine blowing up and killing people and starting fires? And I remember the discussion about, um, I remember Boone Pickens and his Pickens plan, he was gonna save us all with gas and, and wind coming together in this glorious union and we are gonna save the modern uh, economy with this, with this plan. And, and at that time, there was a woman who was head of the American Wind Energy. And Senator Brophy, I know that this is a, a Wyoming uh, perspective question, but um, maybe you might want to sort of illuminate us on sort of Colorado's regulatory environment and how might it compare to what, we're, what we have here in Wyoming. Well, yeah, Colorado's interesting. I, again, um, we set out to make the state as attractive as we could to wind development in 06, 07. I mean, I was our, our governor in 06 who, who ran and won 
uh, ran on the platform of the new energy economy. So, I mean, there's a clear message to people that uh, Colorado's open for business and we want these wind farms to come here. We don't have a state permit at all. Um, state agencies are often consulted, but uh, all of the permitting is done at the county level. And the counties uh, actually you know, work together, learn from each other, what the, what the headaches were with the original developments and, and most of the counties now in eastern Colorado uh, have very similar processes and so um, you know a developer can see that and, and see that it's it's stable and relatively um, easy to work through and they can then come to Colorado if there's uh, an opportunity to, to sell wind energy and you know the other good thing we have going for eastern Colorado is we have practically no federal land in eastern Colorado with the exception of the Bonnie grassland and part of Wells County, so we don't have the headache of dealing with the feds and the way they drag their, their feet on things. I mean, you can you can lease up and get permitted fairly quickly in Colorado. Okay. So, this panel, um, this was the uh, the panel on, um, on uh, state values and identity. And this idea that, um, you know, that we need to identify these unique and valuable landscapes and, uh, and view sheds and other important Wyoming attributes, and um, either figure out some way to protect them or avoid development altogether. So I think that was part of that conversation that was being had yesterday afternoon. Um, and I'm just wondering, uh, so do we have mechanisms here in place, here in Wyoming? And, and, and um, Greg, you can maybe even add to what, what's going on in Colorado in this respect. That does provide us with that ability to um, avoid those places that we think that should that we should avoid for whatever reason. And you know, do we have the mechanisms, and are they working? I just want to sort of throw that out. What do you think? And I'm going to start with you, Ryan, because I know that you've got some ideas here. Well, I think in. I think Holly showed the map from 2010 that we created. It's been updated since with the constraints on it. That, that did a pretty good job of, of sending a clear signal both to the regulatory community, but the regulated community is to those areas that would be tough sledding to get uh, wind developed. I think that map probably needs some updating, especially with some of the shifts in the land use plans since that time. But um, that was a pretty good um, point to start from. Uh, between land use plan allocations with, with federal lands and the other limitations in sage grouse habitat and view sheds of trails um, and nest buffers from raptors, uh, the practical constraints tied to eagle conservation and eagle take permits. And, um, I think that's a pretty good start um, and, and you know, probably just needs updated at this juncture. Okay. John, from the county perspective, I mean, is that something that you is uh, in, in Carbon County or those, I mean, is that a conversation that you have? Is that something that you are concerned about? Is that something that you take into consideration? Short answer, yes. Um, the, the, the view shed issue it, it is, a, is a complicated issue. Um, and most of Carbon County is littered with federal lands, for lack of a better term. And uh, as soon as there's that federal act nexus and, and the Rawls Field Office can get a visual resource uh, amendment to the, to the plan and that. So those are in place when you have a federal nexus. Our, our county plan uh, kind of mirrors that and, and brings that in, so those are things to address. And when you start compiling that on top of uh, the statewide restrictions, core area, and, and those things, you know, from, from that side of the point, you, 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 you're really limiting down. Um, as a private landowner, view sheds to, to me is, 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 you know, if you want to talk about it on public land, that's fine, but I, I have heartburn when you talk about it on private land. So that there becomes a mix in the checkerboard, you know, and on the other side, as a private landowner, if you don't want wind developed, it ain't happening. So you, that, that all mixes in there, how to balance out that whole multiple use philosophy within the public lands, along with the private landowner's interest 
and the community as a whole. It, it, it is a balancing act, but I, I think the mechanisms are there at least to let it be known to the developers that come in in, in those first early stages and the, the public in, in my world. Maybe that's not true in Converse County, but in, in Carbon County, I, that mechanism exists. Okay. And then, so the developers, uh, uh, Mark and, and Juan Carlos, so sort of what signals do you listen to or pay attention to, and um, you know, and how do you how do you uh, uh, how do you receive those signals? You know, is it like are, are you uh, shown a map or you know what is it that you're looking at when you um, start to look at sightings? And, Sure, I mean, there are, um, there, there's a, a large amount of data that's available, uh, and there's a plethora of consultants who have access to that data and have relationships with all of the uh, agencies here that have the data, and I think, uh, you know, this map that, uh, that's still posted on the Game and Fish website, and along with uh, the, the, the newer data from the different agencies, uh, is, a, is a great place to start for any developer in terms of trying to identify, you know, where are the areas of concern and where are the areas that are actually suitable for development. And then once you get past that phase, then I think it's about, uh, you, you know, going to the different agencies and having interactions with them and talking about specific issues about specific site locations and there just seems to be an overall uh, culture of wins and minimization and uh, all my colleagues that I've talked to, you know, competitors and colleagues in the industry, that seems to be uh, an understanding coming in that that's, that's got to be the approach and, and frankly um, I feel like that the uh, Choke Church Sierra Library project has kind of set the bar for that and uh, if, they're, if they didn't go far enough, uh, you know, John and others will tell us and let us know. So um, I, I feel like that uh, it's pretty clear uh, precedent that's set. Yeah, I agree. And, and um, working at the Rollins uh, Field Office with BLM uh, has been uh, also, uh, for us, has been an enlightening experience. And, uh, they, are, they have broken ground, also, you know, growing pains of Choke Cherry, as Mark was saying, and has, has kind of opened the gate for Irving and Wayne in Wyoming and federal lands. Uh, BLM has been an, an active part of that, you know, with pros and cons. They both have kind of learned in the process, and we are benefiting from, from that learning curve to a certain extent. And, uh, we see the process coming along in a, a fairly uh, uh, more expedited uh, fashion now that, that uh, federal regulations came out on, on trying to speed up these processes also at the federal level. So we're gonna see we're gonna see that 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 trend I think getting more efficient in, in the next uh, couple of years, uh, especially with the 2020 sunset date on the PTC. So uh, that, that uh, I think, is, uh, as Mark was saying, and we have a kind of a level playing field. We know uh, what the rules are, and, and that's good. Uh, the, the not so good part is that once you go into the site and you choose that site, because when you go in, uh, you think that the map is what it is, and the map starts changing while you're there because these these projects take six, seven, eight years to build. Then it starts to get tricky because you're already in there. And uh, for example, Sage Grouse was an example. To us, we were fortunate enough to come late into the process, but some people that came before us got their hands burned. And so, so that that's that's the one of the key issues there that you need you need stability to going to one of these projects that are so and so heavy in, in capital investment and and that's that's very delicate uh, to you know money is a shy animal I would say so money you know we run far away when it sees that it, it's at risk so uh, what we have to avoid uh, on all on all parts is to try to to get the risk or try to de-risk these projects to, to make Wyoming understand as a state 
that it needs this uh, additional revenue stream to materialize, and and you know it has to both both sides have to give up something, right? And and that's the key point. Okay. And Senator Brophy, from the from the Colorado perspective, um, um, so if if you know if there are specific places in Colorado that people don't want uh, wind turbines. Uh, how do they uh, make that known, and is there some way that the state or counties at this point uh, may accommodate that? Well, you know, all the wind development in Colorado is, is on the eastern plains, and to the bulk of Colorado, the eastern plains are the equivalent of the family's ugly baby. <laughs> now, it's my ugly baby, so I think it's beautiful, but they don't really care. Um, to the extent that somebody does care, and, and we have this in one of our eastern Colorado counties, in Elbert County, which is uh, uh, the western half of Elbert County is a bedroom community for, for Denver, the Denver metro area. They actually had a, uh, a, a ban on ridgeline development in the county to, to maintain the county's view sheds. Uh, and it was done at the county level. Not you know the state has uh, doesn't weigh in on it at all. And we Eastern Colorado, we would be we would be offended if the three and a half million people that live along the Front Range tried to tell us in Yuma County what matter and how to run our farms and ranches. I mean, we got so mad at them a couple of years ago. We voted to secede and try to join Wyoming. And and you know, so we believe in local control for things along land use. Um, and that's of course comes to oil and gas, but um, we believe in local control. So the only county that we have with uh, with any kind of U-shed requirements is Albert County with no rich land development. And we had that crystal man from New Energy in here earlier where we discovered we were permitting the Rush Creek wind farm for Albert County here um, last fall. But there is a there is um, there's there, there there are problems defining what constitutes a rich line, and we 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 got over that one. Okay, well, I'm going to change directions again. Um, so this next question, I'm responding to, again, what was uh, uh, the yesterday afternoon's panel was somewhat, um, uh, uh, I guess, animated. Uh, and uh, a lot of interesting discussion came out of that. That's the values panel. And I think one thing that uh, Senator Case said is, and I need to look to make sure I got the quote right, and I did write it down. He said, you can't just let developers drive the agenda, okay? I thought that was an interesting uh, point. So then my question then is, well then who should drive the agenda? I'm just gonna open it up there. What do you think? <laughs> John wants to talk. We'll let John start. I, I think if you made that statement 10 years ago, that would have been a correct statement. But I don't think today developers are driving the agenda. The, the, the local uh, culture in the, those individual counties, uh, my county to the west, does not allow any wind development. They, they, they have a prohibition on it. Carbon County uh, embraces it. Um, and I sometimes I take a little issue with that. Um, if, if somebody that owns a lot of surface ground, but I don't own the minerals, so I'm never in the driver's seat on that. The meek inherited the earth, but the rich retain the minerals. And, and in the state of Wyoming, it, it is fine with that. We, we can have a, a gas well on, on 40 acre increments throughout a lot of sections in our county, but Lo and behold, we have a you know a 300 meter turbine sitting out there, and, and the sky is falling in. And I'm, I, I I get lost on this whole argument. You know, where where are we going with this? And where are we, are we at the state legislature level looking to pick winners and losers, or are we going to get back to our roots as, as people in the state of Wyoming and let those who can survive the environment? Survive the environment and, and prosper from that. Anybody? Well, I'd argue that the markets are going to really drive it. Um, we can 
we can fake it that we actually can move the needle, but I guarantee you that if the California market opened up tomorrow and we had opportunities to make millions of dollars, we would make different decisions. If we had transmission lines leading to different places, as we thought would develop in, in the 2000s, they would develop. It, markets work. In this case, they're just not working for a lot of robust wind and renewable, de renewable development here. Um, I also remember the discussions in 2009 when the governor was at Western Governors and Governor Schwarzenegger was there and in a private session, Governor Friedenthal said, look, I'm really sick and tired of California wanting to throw its beer cans in Wyoming while you can have clean air and, and meet your renewable standards in California. That was obviously aimed at this thought that we we're going to have rampant development across our state and, and diminish wildlife and other resources in favor of that. I also remember him looking at Tom Tidwell, who was the chief of the Forest Service at the time, and calling them socialists not once but twice when Tidwell said, we think that private landowners need to have more of the power lines on them as part of their contributions to the national interest in renewables. Um, other people are going to make this determination, but I would say that the biggest determiner of our ability to develop anything in Wyoming is externally driven, and the sooner we come to the reality that we better start self-determining what we want, um, it's going to continue that way. And I, I still don't think we've had that discussion in the state about what we really want. We know what we have, and I don't think we've characterized whether we really want that. Okay, and that begs another question, but I want to hear from both Juan Carlos and Juan. Yeah, I mean, uh, personal opinion. I think uh, basically it's not who who drives the, the car, but what is the car? I mean, it's not who drives the agenda, but what we need to def define, decide is what is the agenda in the end. And because, and that was initially what we talked about on, on setting a possibility of a bill for wind, a bill, uh, draft a bill and run it through the legislature, or have a wind plan for Wyoming. But you need you need to have a plan. I mean, uh, if if not, then you'll have all the stakeholders, each one pulling on their side. But we don't have a long-term vision on what we want to accomplish as a state within the wind industry or the wind business. So the market is going to drive it, and, and it's, a, it's like a boss. If the boss is passing by, if you don't hop in the boss, you're left behind. So we've, you know, we've heard that in the past presentations that you know, we, can, we can look at our, our shoes and our uh, house forever, and, but the rest, of the, you know, the rest of the country is looking at something, something else. And, we have to figure out that the rest of the economy is doing something and is doing doing it quickly. So there is a window of opportunity if you don't if you don't you know agree on what you have to do and, and then make it happen. Uh, then you stay out. And, and uh, as it has been shown by data of the government yesterday and and, and the subsequent presenters, uh, there is a window of opportunity, but it's not going to be there forever. And these projects take time, a lot of capital. Uh, infrastructure, uh, the state was one of, of the things we were talking about some minutes ago. The state could have the mission of building a pipeline, meaning transmission, to get all the energy out of oil generated. And you're going to have hundreds of developers you know, uh, put into that pipeline and paying for it. Uh, so you would have all the benefits that will harvest, but you need to have that agenda. That agenda is a plan that you need to decide which one it is. So I agree that the uh, the market is really the driver here and, uh, and not the developers. Um, we are looking for opportunities, but it's really the market that's going to drive it. Um, however, um, in the last panel, I think, uh, uh, Chairman Russell talked a little bit about uh, 
the opportunity for a, a more robust energy market to open up with the uh, Mountain West Transmission Group and the potential uh, expansion of the Southwest Power Pool uh, as an RTO into this part of the world. Uh, if that were to happen, which it, all indications are it's heading in the right direction, uh, then that, that changes the market dynamic where there's uh, an opportunity for wind projects in this region and, and other uh, energy projects to uh, find new homes for energy to, to bid into uh, a robust energy market. If that happens, again, the market's going to drive that, but once that market opens up, if, if there's uh, an advantage to building a project that injects into that same market in Nebraska or in Colorado or New Mexico versus in Wyoming, then the money's going to go where there's, uh, you know, the, the, lo the levelized cost of energy is lower. And so, I mean, if ultimately, so even though the market drives that, ultimately the state controls that because you have the opportunity to raise the wind tax. You have the opportunity to add incentives to encourage wind. So that that's kind of, uh, and once this, once this uh, marketplace comes into play, then that's really going to become a factor, I think. And, and uh, Greg? I'm, I'm a political guy, so I'll, I'll hop right in on the tail end of that. Uh, um, you know, it, it, uncertainty causes problems, and, and, and believe me, I'm, I'm a homer for Eastern Colorado. Uh, if, if the infrastructure, the transmission infrastructure is there uh, to take the electricity from the Mountain West, to California or wherever Microsoft wants to build their data center, um, I'm going to be I'm going to be arguing with these developers that you got a, a stable taxation environment in Colorado. You better come down here so that you have the certainty that you're not going to be you know you're not going to see your tax expenses going up every time the legislature meets. So I, I think until you until you get that settled, that question settled here in Wyoming, and you're blessed. I mean, your wind is better than ours. So you ought to be able to have a slightly higher rate of taxation, but you know you, you have other states that are giving things away. And I like you know, and I'm not a farmer, so if you, if you go to a farm auction and you're bidding against somebody who's who's uh, playing with other people's money, you know I, I call that bidding against idiots. You end up you know often you get you get outbid, and you you got to be careful about not letting that happen to your state. But you need to have the certainty for developers. Um, especially because the, the PTC thing is driving people to make decisions quickly and they want to have certainty that their taxation expenses are going to be stable over time and not subject to fluctuation every time the legislature meets. Um, I wanted to sort of circle back on something you said, Ryan, and, and maybe I'm going to put words in your mouth, I'm not sure if I get it right, if I got it right, but I mean, is it is it that we need to spend some time in Wyoming here trying to determine our destiny with respect to wind. Um, I, I think I, and, and Juan, I think you also mentioned something about that as well. I mean, is there, is there still work that we need to do in order as a state to say, yes, we're, you know, we want wind, we want it this way. Um, is, that, is that something that we really need to be doing? And, um, and I don't know if that's planning or if that's leadership. But I want to have that, that conversation. Is that something we're a place that we need to go? And I want to again start with you, Brian, um, and then we'll uh, we'll move on around. Uh, he, yeah, I, I think we can have the discussion. I mean, we've been having it on a host of different levels in this state. You know, if we want oil and gas, yeah, where do we want it, not there, but over here. Okay, good. Let's go. Let's do that. Wind in the two thousands. Um, yeah, we want it over there. Not a chance in the world we're going to have it, you know, on the top of the Wind River Range. Um, and there's just practical reality associated with a lot of the development that can't happen in the state. I, I think the bigger issue for, for us as a state is is not really in whether it's wind or solar or oil and gas or coal. Um, I think we have to just come to terms with some of the market realities that are out there. The future of coal is not good. Um, that may be anathema to say in this state, but it's not good. Um, gas markets are, the geography of energy in the gas side has changed. Um, when I was a kid, this was the only place to come. 
the Rocky Mountain West was it. Now you have development all over the eastern seaboard, it seems, at least up in the Pennsylvania shales and that. And the reality is that, that we're no longer able to control a lot of these things and make that decision for ourselves. And so I think we're going to have to address those realities of those markets, address the realities of what our economy is going to look like, and then start to determine what fits that niche. In a place like Carbon County, they've made some active decisions to say, you know what, the Choke Cherry Sierra project, that makes some sense. In um, my home country of you know, the Bighorn Basin, they've made the determination that, you know, we're going to be a gateway community to Yellowstone, that's what we're going to do. Um, down in the south central part of the state, they're going to be a big gas field for a little while. In Casper, they're in that growing pain phase. Um, I think no matter what industry you're talking about, we've always struggled with do we want it or do we not? The reality is we're going to have a little bit of all of it. The question is, as a state, how does that fit? And are, are we actually going to be able to build ourselves with that as a platform? And, and, I, and I don't know that we can right now. I mean, the fact that, that California controls so much right now, the fact that you have so much of our, of our economy dependent on what energy mix we're going to have, when we don't control any of it. I mean, we have 500,000 souls to consume energy. Um, I would argue the governor of California and, and Chairman Russell said in the last panel has a lot more control over our, our destiny than we should let him have today. All right, anybody follow on? Yeah, back to, as I say, I'm back to disagree. <laughs> um, basically, uh, the um, market uh, for According to that rationale, the market for coal and it's, uh, for Wyoming's coal has decided outside of Wyoming, which is the case. So the same would play for uh, renewable energy in this case, not just California. I mean, it's a, it's a nationwide market and you have some new uh, technology and transmission at the federal level that will, you could be producing a uh, kilowatt of medicine bow and dispatching it to New York City, paying just one uh, weaving charge in the near future, not far away. So it's a decision uh, the state makes to either embrace wind and see it as a complementary, very important source of income, and then lay the, the groundwork and and uh, planning and regulation to give it long-term vision. If the wind developer has long-term vision, they will come. If, if as they say, build, they'll come. If you build transmission uh, to get the kilowatts out of Wyoming, because Wyoming, exactly like coal, is gonna be an exporter, a net exporter of energy. It's been a net, net exporter of energy with oil, with gas, with coal, and now with kilowatts from wind. And that's what we're talking about. So we're just dispatching wind, uh, which we have in, in just about the best resource in the U.S. We have 95% of class 7 wind in 5% of the area of the whole U.S. But we need to do something with it. So that's, that's catching transform it to kilowatts and send it somewhere else. And we're gonna get paid for it. And everybody's gonna benefit. Exactly as we do with coal, exactly as we do with natural gas, exactly as we do uh, with the, the oil. So uh, Wyoming is a next net exporter of energy. It's a very rich one. You only half a million people sitting on huge resources. So now the mix has changed and the, the main resource we had, which is coal, is figuring out because of technological and economical basic problems, fundamental problems that are not going to change in the, in the midterm and are going to worsen in the long term. So you need, again, you need a plan B. And plan B for us, uh, that we're here on this business, and we see the opportunity coming, and it's going to be uh, you know, the way of the future in the energy sector. You see uh, electric cars, Germany is going to build 
a combustion engine car, a new combustion engine car by 2020. So the last BMW made in Germany with a combustion, internal combustion engine in Germany for selling within Germany. It's going to be produced December 31st, 2019. So imagine, that is Germany. So that's coming as fast as you can imagine. It's going to be much faster than we think. So that trend we see in the coal, uh, grass that Dr. Gobby said, uh, showed us yesterday, that suddenly just kind of flat, that's not necessarily going to happen that way. So we need to prepare for that and, and make a plan ASAP to, for when that market that Mark is talking about comes along, uh, we're ready to hop on the bus. And that, that's a policy, an issue, and, and you need to, to really, not to like when you need to, as Lloyd very always says, uh, the state needs to embrace wind. There's a huge difference between liking wind and embracing wind. So you need to embrace wind as you do embrace fossil fuels. It's exactly the same. And uh, regulations will come so everybody uh, has uh, respect for the environment, view shed, and everything that needs to be taken care of. But you need to get the opportunity. That's the point. John, I want to bring you into this. So you're thinking about uh, so, so this idea of um, our, you know, coming out in front. So the state of Wyoming, people of Wyoming, saying, okay, we need to either assert some leadership and say yes, we want wind, or we want wind under certain conditions, or we don't want wind, but we need to be, we need to send those signals. Does that make sense to you? Is that something that you think that, as a county commissioner? That's a, a role for for us as the, as residents in Wyoming, at the state of Wyoming, to be be sending those signals. Um, yes, um, and I go back in, in, in something that's been reoccurring is uncertainty in the state of Wyoming, and and, and I think Juan Carlos saying either we need to step up to the plate and and embrace it in certain areas, and in certain areas we're not going to have it. We, we probably need to maybe drill down on that a, a little bit more. But, you know, Wyoming, unfortunately, we export everything in this state. We, we, we export our energy, we export our children, we, we, we export everything in the state. And, and, you know, Carbon County, we haven't sold an ounce of coal out of, out of Carbon County in about six years. I mean, we, we felt that our, our assessed valuation was over a billion dollars in 2010. Uh, last year it was 540 million. So we, we need to have that discussion and, and we need to keep going. We've we got to quit fighting amongst ourselves and, and use this as, as one more um, line in our portfolio for the state so that we can keep diversifying and not going back to, to the same things that my granddad depended on when, when he was in the legislature. And uh, Mark, any, anything in that direction? Or Greg? All right, so I want to, so we've got a couple more minutes before we go to um, uh, questions from the audience. Um, I want to talk a little bit about, some, all right, so we're going to try to get ahead of this, provide um, some signals, signals or not, in the industry and saying, yes, we want it, no, we don't, we want it under certain conditions. What is it that we um, really need to be planning for with respect to our future? I mean, sort of, is it, is it simply we want wind under certain conditions or we want wind power only in certain places? Or, you know, is it, are we looking, do we need to be thinking in terms of other types of um, thinking in the long term about how we're going to take this industry over time? So, for example, do we need to be thinking about planning for uh, community stability uh, when we're dealing with wind? Uh, so it's, it's broader than just whether we want wind or not, or where we want wind. Um, so I guess the, the question is, is, you know, how can communities prepare themselves uh, for changes in workforce demands over time, or um, begin to look at this over the long term? And is that, you know, how do we do that in Wyoming? And, um, and or should we be doing that in Wyoming? And what does that mean for developers when you think about that? 
um, that question as well. So this idea of getting ahead of, of wind and making some decisions as a state, what is it that we really need to be planning for and how do we do that? Pretty broad question. I, open it up. Um, I, I think with, with, with wind anyway, the industrial siting process, I think, kind of carries into that. And each community that, that these projects are going in will be affected differently. Um, you know, the, the Cardinal County C. Rollins, you know, these projects um, are more determined by what Sinclair Refiner's going to be doing that construction season, not by what, what these projects are going to be doing during that construction season. We're, we're used to an influx of between 15 and 2,000 uh, employees in, in, in a construction season. So, you know, but there's some, you know, something that's closer to Laramie, they're not used to that influx. They don't have the, the infrastructure to, to, to handle that workforce over the long term, where um, part of what makes Carbon County be able to handle it was crashing coal, and we got an empty community sitting there between Rollins and Madison Bow, but you know, no pun intended there, but you know, we we have that chalk absorber in Carbon County where other communities won't. So I don't think we have one size fits all, and that's where the industrial siting process comes in, where you know you're looking out their head and you start planning what do we need to do? Do we need to zone for a man camp in the, into this area, or do we need to do, do that? That that's the beauty of, of the industrial siting process for the for the construction that comes forward. Okay. The only thing I'd add, and, and I've entered the industrial siting amendments that were made since 2010, were very logical in terms of, of how those impact payments are made. I think the other critical part that we fought for, and you all fought for alongside of us, was making sure that the split in where that generation tax goes favors the county so you can make sure that those revenues keep pace for the locality so they can take care of those impacts themselves because as the state gets further and further behind the eight ball in terms of its revenue picture, we have to make sure that those, those funds are going directly to the impact area. So between the industrial siting changes and the tax policy, those revenues get to the place that, that needs them and then let the state general fund sort of out as, as it's able with other uh, needs. And I, I should probably know the answer to this, but I don't. I'll tell you, uh, Northeastern Junior College in Sterling has a wind tech program to specifically train up people to become technicians for the wind farms. And they, they place almost every kid who graduates from that almost immediately upon graduation. So if, if UW doesn't have something like that or Casper doesn't have something like that, it would, it would behoove the the institutions to set about doing that because I mean, if, if half of that 8,000 megawatts gets built here, at least you won't be exporting those kids out of the state. Well, actually, uh, Laramie County Community College does have a program like that, so I, I commend them. And uh, it's an opportunity for uh, folks that have um, you know skill sets coming out of the coal and oil and gas industry that translate well into uh, this type of work, uh, like wind, uh, make, wind turbine maintenance technicians. Uh, they can be trained right here locally, and uh, there's great opportunities for that. There's also great opportunities just thinking about jobs, great opportunities for the state to encourage uh, different aspects of the supply chain for the wind industry, whether or not, and not just for Wyoming, but for uh, you know exporting services and exporting um, uh, parts of uh, wind turbines uh, into um, other markets as well. So um, you'll see, you see that happening in Iowa, you see it happening in Colorado. Factories are being built for towers, for blades, uh, maintenance services, uh, all, all sorts of stuff. And so uh, to the extent that uh, that can be uh, encouraged and you know those sorts of opportunities incentivized into the state, that'll help uh, um, bring additional uh, opportunities for the residents as well. Juan Carlos, do you have something to add? No, just uh, for as an example of, of what Mark was exactly talking about. Um, the state um, 
kind of co-participated with, with uh, Gold and the uh, Chinese manufacturer of, of turbines. And um, they did some, I think, three, four workshops. Three workshops, uh, one in uh, Rollins, uh, one in Gillette, one in Casper. And the attendance was impressive. We had like 200 people uh, go to each one of those for a retraining program or a training program for wind turbine technicians. And, and that was that was really, uh, I mean, the, the level of interest shown at those was pretty impressive on, on the you know, bottom side, the community and, and people. So everybody was looking at, at this as, as a real opportunity for you know, to kind of transition from one previous activity to, to this one. So, uh, and, and that would be the case for, for many uh, possible alternatives on, on people thinking about leaving the state or staying here and they find a way you know, to, to hop onto the, the new uh, whatever. The bus. Right. <laughs> Any other comments from the panel before we open it up? All right, so this is a conversation that actually we should have had with you. I mean, I think this is the kind of conversation that um, that maybe we can start here, I don't know, but it's this idea of, you know, what if, what is it? You know, what should we be doing with our, our destiny here in Wyoming with respect to wind? And uh, so I'll open it up, uh, and we'll start in the back. We have a question back there. Oh, over here, Steve, Professor. Okay, number two. I'd like to offer a little different perspective on Carbon County. Um, we were threatened by rampant real estate speculation in the late 90s, or not late 90s, late 80s, early 90s. And there was uh, out-of-staters coming in and buy up huge chunks of land in the checkerboard because it was so cheap and then sell it to people in magazines, 40s, 80s, 160s. People buy it sight unseen because it's cheap land. So our land use plan really didn't address that because uh, the people really hadn't revisited that, so we had a revision of the land use plan, and the people definitely valued their open spaces, their wildlife, and the way Carbon County was. Um, skip forward, uh, I guess it was 2006, when the discussion about wind got rampant, and we had a um, problem in a, our land use plan and our related zoning accepted industrial wind as part of ag zoning. It, it was accepted in the ag zoning. That was a mistake. It should have been separated. Then the people would have had more leverage to influence the county commissioners who are the absolute local control in the state of Wyoming, nothing gets past the county commissioners. If we had that at that point in time where they didn't just throw up their hands and say, well, it's accepted in the ag zoning, we wouldn't be discussing this here today. So you should split industrial wind. If you have a county land use plan, update it and get your zoning regulations to reflect what the current situation is because Industrial wind is not compatible in ag zones. It's development. It's just as bad of a of, of threat as the scattered rural subdivisions were that Dr. Tex Taylor told the counties that uh, you were losing money on it. It was costing more money and it was bringing it. So, kind of same thing. Any response? I like, on, on the Facebook, Scott, I would disagree. I, I understand where you're going, and, and that's where the conditional use permits come in. That's actually a higher bar, because they have to come in and justify that conditional use. If, if you went in and just zoned it industrial, and, and then, then you're also putting at risk the, the ag exemption that, that is on that land for the, the family operations. But if you zone it industrial, and you say these are permitted uses, then you lose all control over those uses that occur in there. If you regulate this through the conditional use permit process, then you're able to hold them to a higher standard than if you just have it in your county use plan 
that you can just you know, go. Wind is acceptable on ag land with a conditional use permit. All right, so we'll take another question in the back here. <coughs> uh, my question is for Juan Carlos. Uh, much of what we've discussed over the past two days has to has, has to do with proper siting and foresight about siting. As I understand it, uh, the Veritas project is going to is projected to occur where the very successful reintroduction of the Blackfoot Ferret has occurred uh, by the Miami Game Fish Department in co cooperation with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. How is your company addressing the needs of, of a very highly endangered species, one of the most endangered species on the planet still? How is your company addressing those issues that may surround that endangered species? Yes, uh, yeah, we are very much aware of, of uh, that issue. Uh, we, uh, we have retained uh, ICF International, and they are uh, currently running all the say, studies uh, in conjunction with uh, fish and Wildlife Service, who is uh, Wyoming Game and Fish. Uh, we already have roughly three to four years of, of data on, on all species, uh, all uh, watershed uh, in the region, and also we're completing three years, uh, full years of eagle uh, activity, and we'll both uh, um, bald eagle and golden eagle in the area. So we have, we have spent basically four years uh, surveying the whole area. Uh, we are doing sage crowds. Even though we are completely out of, out of uh, core area, we are surveying uh, sage crowds by, by plane. Uh, so we are also working with uh, Wyoming Game and Fish on the program to um, have Migratory major species like elk, uh, pronghorn, and uh, sorts uh, in the winter to uh, see migratory patterns on, on those. So, um, uh, the uh, policy basically in the company is, is on a full compliance basis with, with the regulations on the federal, uh, state, and local levels on the environmental side. So, uh, we, have, we have spent a lot of time. At, a lot of resources on, on that front. So uh, anything that comes out in the end, uh, meaning on mitigation uh, from the project side, uh, it's going to be compliant with all federal and, and state regulation. Other questions? Yes, sir. We've got one here, and we've got one here, and one in the back. So we've got one, two, and three. Mm -hmm. just, just a quick one for Juan Carlos and for Mark. When you develop projects in areas in which a significant part of the real estate values are the scenic values or the recreational values and things like that, do you do you and other developers routinely compensate non-participating landowners for any decline in the property values associated with that? I just assuming there are independent appraisals and things like that. Yeah, in our case, in our case, we are dealing only in, in uh, federal and state plan. So we have basically leases with the state or any place for redevelopment, and, and those leases are, are specific. Or um, we can have also a minerals development company with an RP, so we can have a grazing lessee also grazing on the same uh, territory, same as BLM. We also have a uh, let's say we're gonna, 90 to 10 percent, let's say 90 percent BLM, 10 percent state, roughly. We don't have one acre of private land. Uh, we're mostly the opposite side of most uh, developments in the state. So, uh, from that perspective, what we are dealing with is basically when, on federal policy on on UCHED, for example, are working with BLM to see how the DRM, the visual visual resource management goes within that area, and there is a planning for that uh, right now. Uh, so uh, we are working actively with BLM uh, on, on that front. So mitigation on the visual side, uh, it would be through the federal agency, basically. And the state agency doesn't have a, a regulation on the BLM process as, as such, but uh, we would be respectful of, of whatever, uh, say, holistic approach we take to, to that 
uh, on that front with on the state land also. So it's it's a more or less an ongoing process right now. And that's that's more or less the case. And on, on the other side, we are in a very, very isolated place. So there's basically no communities here, active communities. Medicine Bow is roughly 22 miles down the road. So we are north of, of Dunlap uh, Wind Farm, which is a Pacific world. Uh, let's say our, that's our neighbor to the south, southeast. And then we go to the basin, uh, roughly to, to that area. So there's uh, no other developments in the area uh, right now. Uh, there's only Q Creek Ranch that is uh, planning on a development to the, to the east of, of the basin. Uh, so roughly all the projects that were in the basin kind of threw in the towel uh, by 2012 and uh, we kind of picked up uh, all those other projects that, that were there and so we are developing now the, the, the basin as a unit. I was, um, I was actually, it was a more general question. We decide this specific development. I'm, I'm thinking more generally in developments that you've been involved in anywhere where you have landowners that are adjacent and they may, they, they may very well be that these non, these kinds of values are impaired or, or determined to be impaired. Are developers routinely compensating landowners for those declines? And in that case, you work, you try to work out before you develop anything. And if you see that the ambulance for development is, is not good, as some projects here that uh, I'm not going to name are having legal problems since a long time ago, uh, then we don't go in there. Uh, we try to be in uh, mostly isolated places where you're about to not interfere with human activity at, at the, you know, city or town level, uh, maybe not to have communities by the wind farms, and uh, that's our policy on that. On that front. I would just say, in general, um, there's there's nothing routine. Every site location is different, right? Uh, but there's certainly, uh, if, if a site location, uh, if it makes sense to do so, it, it certainly would be routine to enter into discussions with folks who have those concerns and identify if there is a reasonable mitigation, some sort of solution. Uh, I mean, it could be screening, it could be easements, it could be participation in the project, there could be all kinds of things. Uh, that could, and uh, our experience has been if we can't satisfy the people that are uh, directly impacted, um, we haven't built there. But that's just been our experience. I think we have, we have a question over here where somebody has the mic and then we're going to go to the stage. Hi, my question is for Juan Carlos and specifically about your Shirley Basin project. Uh, since your project is all 100% on BLM land and you just mentioned that it would allow well, like gas leasing, grazing leases, but you didn't say anything specifically about recreational opportunities. That land is used extensively in the fall for hunting and other camping and recreational activities. Would that still be allowed during your project? Yes, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the weekend of the eclipse, we had a, a meeting with, uh, with some of the hunting groups in the area, because they were, they were posing exactly the same concern. And we told them that on public lands, uh, there is no, on our side, there will be no fencing, basically. And we would be uh, completely open to people maintain the same use they have on land right now, for hunting or fishing or uh, sightseeing or whatever uh, they, they plan on doing. Uh, the only thing we joked about with them was we went about the little cameras on, on all the turbines to see who, who would start shooting at them. That was it. <laughs> but uh, in general, the, the perception was that that uh, we would be wide open to, to that same land use as is today. No restrictions. So having worked for the state for eight out of the last 10 years, I'm well aware of the divide that exists relative to support or non-support for wind, which is fine. Um, everybody has an opinion. But when the last train load of coal leaves Wyoming to be used for coal fire generate for uh, 
for electric generation. And that day will come. We hope it's a long ways off, but it will come. When electric vehicles have a big part of the market, and crude oil is trading for $40 a barrel, and natural gas is still $3, and MFDTU, where is Wyoming? And if we don't develop wind in a big way, which we could easily, where is Wyoming going to get the funds to run the state? And just as important, where are the jobs going to come from? Anybody want to take a stab at that one? This is a political question. <laughs> right. But I don't know. I, I don't know. Um, I think that's a conundrum that's facing the state, and, it's, and I think that last load of coal will be a long distance in the future, but, but in terms of the intermediate market for coal, just look at Rocky Mountain Power's plans in Wyoming for generation. Coal isn't a central facet of it on a going forward basis. Um, my argument isn't that we should be looking at trying to optimize all of those returns. My, the thesis of my argument is I don't know how much of that we control. Um, I heard it when we put on the gen tax. If you put on the generation tax, you're going to kill wind development in Wyoming. The, the reality is what California does has a heck of a lot more to do with us than that gen tax. It's a competitive disadvantage in certain circumstances, but the capacity factors, I think, make up for that. What the U.S. Congress does with the PTC in 2020 will have a heck of a lot more impact than what we do in Wyoming. I think the, I think the real question for the country is, well, what are we going to have in the energy mix? And then why we can supply some or most of that, depending on what resources we choose to put into that mix. I think the tax base question is a fascinating one and one we're going to grapple with sooner rather than later. And all you have to do is look at all of the interim committee work on trying to fill the $300 million gap in education funding. We used to do that with a snap of our fingers and go out with another lease sale on coal and take the bonus bid money and go build more schools. It just doesn't happen anymore. Um, you can go back and hit a well in Ohio for natural gas and blow the doors off of anything we used to brag about in the Jones field. The, the geography of, of energy has shifted and we're, we're captive to a bigger market that has a lot of other considerations that are now being laid on our energy mix. The, the decision on climate change, we can be for or against it. The reality is the kid in California is, is believes in climate change and if there is one coal electron in the mix going to California, that will prejudice our, our ability to sell power to California. And then you bring dispersed power into the mix, you bring in storage technology, you bring in solar and other renewables that will compete with, with wind. Um, guys, I, I hate to tell you, but we're going to be the tail, and we are not going to wag the dog. It, it's being wagged for us as a, not only a U.S. matter, but as a global matter. Anybody else want to weigh in on that one? Just the, I, I, I feel your pain because Eastern Colorado is substantially the same as Wyoming. You know, we, we are natural resource producers of, of agricultural products and energy products. And, and just like the, the beaver trade discovered when, you know, they switched over to wearing silk hats. It was, out of, it was something completely out of their control that forever changed their, their destiny. Uh, and then on top of that, for Eastern Colorado, maybe this is part of what we can do besides energy. Um, my, my, my fear for Eastern Colorado is that when we continue to add 100,000 people to the front range of, of the state, they're going to suck all of the water out of the rest of Eastern Colorado. And so the, the little bit of ag production that we have out there from irrigation is going to also disappear. And we're going to, uh, I have one county that I used to represent that sold all its water out and or almost all its water. That is, that sucks. Uh, so maybe, 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 you know, we're, we're trying to embrace a, a genuinely all of the above energy production. Uh, we're even actively embracing um, the organic movement in agriculture, uh, producing 20 some thousand uh, irrigated acres of organic alfalfa now in, in uh, my part of North 
Northeast Colorado. It's just whatever we can do to uh, meet market demand and try to grow our economy. And you know, I, I'm a I'm a fan of storage of water. So if you can figure out how to get you know get storage built, I mean, that makes a perfect battery for right now. Anyway, just let you know run water uphill when you have cheap electricity to run it downhill when you need it. Other questions? We tap you out. Okay, well, uh, I'd like to uh, thank our panel for uh, spending their afternoon with you.